Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum. We are so pleased that you have joined us today. My name is Joy Murphy. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the, at the library. Today we are pleased to welcome Mr. Kevin Hemel, who will talk to us about Patton's War. And um, I am going to turn it right on over to you, Mr. Hemel. Thank you so much, Joy. It's been a pleasure working with you getting to this point. Um, I'll just do a, a little bio of myself before we get started. I've actually spoken at the Eisenhower Library before um, on the topic of Patton. I had written a book called Patton's Photographs about the photographs that he took with his own camera during World War II. And I was fortunate enough to speak at the library a couple of years back. Um, just a little bit on me. I'm a contract historian at Arlington National Cemetery. I've worked as an historian for the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force um, at Fort Leavenworth, uh, Lackland Air Force Base, a number of different places around the country. Um, I've been fascinated with World War II and American history most of my life. Um, got my master's degree from Villanova University and um, have really focused my attention on General George S. Patton. Uh, my first book, Patton's Photographs. Kind of got me started, got me used to the materials. Uh, I studied under Martin Blumenson, my mentor and friend. Uh, I later helped write a book with him, a small biography of Patton, about 100 pages. But then in 2004, my friend Dr. John McManus recommended that I really do a deep dive into General Patton. And the result is this trilogy. The first book came out about a year ago. And uh, second volume is due out in May. And I'm working on third. And what I've really done here is studied Patton's leadership in World War II. And instead of just using the usual resources of his diaries and letters, I basically went into the Library of Congress, went through thousands and thousands of soldiers' memoirs, uh, went to their veteran history collection, uh, checked out different veterans that had served under Third Army to see if they had met Patton. I also studied at the Army War College, uh, to looking at their World War II surveys of World War II veterans, uh, gathering up stories there. I've even done research at uh, the Imperial War Museum in London and in different um, depositories around the United States. So that's a little bit of my background. What I'm going to talk to today is basically the first chapter of my book, which is also subsequently the first day of combat for Major General George S. Patton. He was only a two-star general at the time. We're talking about November 8th, 1942, when Patton's task force is going to land on the shores of Morocco. Um, so why don't we step right in. Joy, if you'd hit the next slide, please. So we're gonna be looking at um, General Patton. Next slide, there we go. So uh, this is George S. Patton basically on the eve of battle. Uh, he is, is dressed in most, uh, <clears throat> sorry, he's dressed in the dress uniform. Um, Patton's background, he was a West Point graduate. He um, served in the U.S. Army from about 1909 onward. He served in the Mexican punitive expedition after Pancho Villa, where he shot two bandits. Well, he shot one and assisted uh, in shooting two others with a, at, his, at the time, one of his ivory handled pistols. He later served in World War I uh, on the staff of John J. Pershing, and then later went on to command the first U.S. Army Tank Corps in the battles of Samiel and Ruz Argon, where he'll eventually be wounded uh, and will have to sit out the end of the war. He really thought he had a future in tanks, but the U.S. Army had different ideas. They got rid of the Tank Corps in 1920. He reverted back to cavalry, his original branch. But with the war clouds glooming uh, around 1939, the United States started beefing up its forces. At the same time, Patton rose through the ranks to where he commands the second armored division. Uh, but he, that does not last very long. He's quickly promoted the three-star general and made a corps commander. Um, and the idea uh, in the United States in the Roosevelt administration and the higher powers was to get the United States Army involved in the war in Europe and the Mediterranean as soon as possible. Unfortunately, with the fleet laying in ruins in Pearl Harbor and the Army basically minuscule compared to what it would become, we couldn't gather these forces until almost a year later. Um, this is going to be Operation Torch, which I'll go into right now. Next slide. Patton was on board the USS Augusta. 
Um, this is uh, Admiral Hewitt's uh, command ship. Uh, next slide, please. I know where it is. Um, and this is going to be the spearhead of Patton's Western Task Force. This is going to be about 100 ships bringing in about 35,000 troops about 450 tanks and about 420 uh, fighter aircraft. The object here is to go to, to, to fight, not the Germans, but the Vichy French. And I'll go into that in a second. Next slide. So here's Patton with some of the members of his staff. Uh, to our left is Hap Gay, uh, one of his, his deputies, well, one of his aides really. And then to his right or to our right, is Jeffrey Keyes, his deputy commander. Uh, Patton said that he would do a great job if he were to be killed on the battlefield. He was very direct about these kind of things, talking about war, death, and killing, you know, that earned him the name Old Blood and Guts back in the 1930s uh, when he was teaching tactics. Next slide, please. So this is Operation Torch. Like I said, the idea is to get American soldiers on the ground and fighting the enemy as soon as possible. There are going to be three task force, and if we go from right to left, you can see in red in the center of the screen the Eastern Task Force under General Ryder, the Central Task Force under General Fredenall, and then, of course, the Western Task Force under Patton. The Eastern and Central Task Force are going to actually come from England and incorporate a number of British ships and British commandos to support the United States troops. Patton is the only task force that's actually going to come across the Atlantic to land in Morocco. And now I mentioned that they would not be fighting the Germans, they would be fighting the Vichy French. Uh, so in 1940, when uh, Adolf Hitler took over France, uh, he made a deal with French leadership that as long as he could uh, control the northern sections of France and all of its coast, they could contain a small part of the country for themselves. This is Vichy France. The agreement was that uh, they would fight any war, any enemy, to Germany, but the Allies, Churchill and Roosevelt, really believed that once American soldiers got on the ground, the Vichy French would quickly change colors and join the Allied cause. Um, and that is that is the reason why this is mostly an American force with some British and the two other task forces. So uh, the idea, like I said, was to get boots on the ground. And if you can see that the objective is to head east, because uh, if you go west into, or if you go further west into, further east into Libya, you've got uh, Field Marshal, British Field Marshal uh, Montgomery, who is driving Rommel and the, uh, the African, the German African army, actually it's German and Italian army, uh, they're driving them west into Tunisia. So the idea is to get Rommel sandwiched between these two forces. Now, during the planning stages in Washington, D.C., the British said they did not want Patton's task force. They said it was too far away from the battlefield. It would be ineffective. They had a number of meetings about this. And the British were so adamant that it drove Patton crazy. He got so mad one day that he stormed home, went into his living room, and he picked up this basically one foot tall lava statue called Charlie that his wife had gotten him in uh, Hawaii in the 1930s. And it was a war god, and it was meant to bring Patton luck. Well, Patton basically felt that the war gods had turned on him. So he picks up Charlie, marches out to his backyard, and spikes him into the pond they have in the backyard. Uh, Patton was really furious about this. But as the negotiations go on, it's really Roosevelt who steps in and says, no, we are going to have this operation in Morocco because we're going to need the closest coast you know, to land on uh, for the United States. You know, he's really thinking about future operations from the United States. George C. Marshall, uh, I should mention, George C. Marshall was against this whole plan. He really wanted to go directly into Europe. George C. Marshall being the chief of staff of the army, basically what is today the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He wanted to go directly into Europe, uh, but Churchill realized that the American forces weren't strong enough. Marshall picks Dwight D. Eisenhower to lead this invasion, and it's Eisenhower who really does pick Patton for this force. Uh, their friendship goes way back to the 1920s, where they served together at Camp Colt. Uh, they became very good friends, would discuss tank tactics, and it's when the Army cut off the tank corps in 1920 that Eisenhower went back to the infantry, Patton went back to the cavalry. So, um, 
So we understand now the task force. Now, if you look at patents, he's got three landing beaches uh, further north near Rabul, the central near Casablanca, and the southern one near Safi. Next slide, please. So this is the northern attack force. This is going to be under uh, General Lucian Truscott, who is the assistant division commander for the 3rd Infantry. And it's mostly going to be elements of the 3rd Infantry and the 9th Infantry. They're going to go ashore here. They're going to fight up the Cebu River. You can see it right there in the center of the screen. Their objective is to take the airport at Port Lawadi. And um, there's a Spanish fort right at the entrance of that river that really holds up the force. Uh, there's a very tough fighting for about three days. The French actually take American prisoners. Uh, next slide. And now this is the central attack. This is General Patton. He's commanding General Anderson, the commander of the 3rd Infantry. Of course, a lot of you might realize that Anderson will be relieved after this battle and, and Truscott will become the commander of the 3rd Infantry uh, Division. And that's going to lead to a basically meteoric rise for him. Uh, these troops are mostly 3rd Infantry. The idea is to land at Fadala Beach. You can see Fadala has a little harbor there um, and then drive south to Casablanca, uh, Patton's real target. Now the Southern force, one more down. Next slide, please. There it is. Uh, this is about 150 miles south of Patton. This is the, the city of Safi. And this is a very important port to take. Uh, this is gonna be mostly 9th Infantry divisions doing the initial assault. But the idea here is to get Patton's tanks uh, on the ground. And for that, you need a port. Uh, we didn't have the sort of landing craft that could deploy tanks as quickly as you might remember from D-Day and, and further operations. Uh, but this is Ernie Harmon, the commander of the 2nd Armored Division. He's going to land here and then make a drive for Casablanca, a very tough task. You realize he doesn't have the fuel with it, but he gets along well with his Navy commanders, and they agree to land a little further north and refuel his tanks to help him get up there. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So um, Patton's troops, like I said, are going to be going ashore uh, on Fadala. Uh, it is actually a nighttime landing before sunrise. <clears throat> These are some of the troops actually during the daylight. Patton wakes up around 2 a.m. that morning on the Augusta. And, um, you know, he's preparing himself for battle. Uh, when the sun, it, 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 It's pitch black, obviously, and the, the, the rope ladders go down along the ships. Soldiers climb down into landing craft to go in. Patton's watching all of this in the darkness. He says, you know, he can very, see very few things. By the way, the soldiers going ashore, the password and response for this battle, the password is George and the response is Patton. Uh, that's what the infantry would say to each other if you didn't know if the, the guy near you was friend or foe. Um, the landings were delayed. Uh, Patton said that on the horizon, he saw a light shoot up into the sky. That was the signal that all was well. Well, that light actually turns down onto the beach and he can hear firing. So he realizes the French are not going to roll over for these beaches. It is going to be a fight. Um, a, a submarine is going to come up next to the Augusta and kind of guide it in along with other, other destroyers so that they can give uh, support to the troops there. Um, Patton was planning on going ashore early, but out of the morning mist comes the French fleet and a naval battle is going to ensue. In fact, Patton's going to be down on the deck of the Augusta looking, uh, looking at the battle when a shell is going to land near him in the water. And it causes a huge geyser uh, that's completely yellow. It's a yellow dye marker. So Patton's going to start the battle off uh, coated in yellow on his uniform. Um, he was going to go board a landing craft. And so they swung it out on davits. And Patton had earlier packed a trunk with everything to go ashore including his ivory handled pistols. And at the last minute, he asked George Meeks, his African-American aide, to retrieve the pistols. He, he preferred to wear them. And so Meeks goes and retrieves them. And just after he did this is when the French fleet appears and the Augusta fires and the backblast from its, uh, from its big guns basically bends Patton's landing craft in half. And so it has to be dropped into the water. And so it's this one of sort of one of those prescient moments where Patton, you know, was able to hold on to his pistols because he kind of thought ahead of time or something just nudged him in that direction. Um, after the naval battle, Patton's going to sit down and have a meal with the, with the Navy officers. He, he says naval combat is soft. 
and he, wor- he actually worried about the whole trip over there. He was getting too fat from the Navy meals. Um, so about 12 noon, he's going to come up on deck. Next slide. And he's going to be preparing to go ashore. There he is with Admiral Hewitt, Kent Hewitt. You can see Patton's belt that's going to have his two ivory handled pistols. And you see the little pouch in the front. That's actually a police handcuff pouch that Patton used to hold a compass. Uh, you can see his two star rank, and he's got the second, uh, second armored corps or first armored corps symbol on his uh, uniform. That's what it what That's the corps he commanded before it was turned into what's called the Western Task Force. Um, next slide. So Pat's going to climb down into his landing craft. And you can see in the center of the screen, there's George Meeks holding a Thompson machine gun. Um, as he prepares to go ashore, the crew of the Augusta sends up a huge cheer. And uh, next slide. And so Patton's going to don his helmet, uh, showing his teeth to the, to the crew, uh, sort of a final salute as he goes to shore. The trip ashore is going to take about 20 minutes. Next slide. And as Patton comes ashore, he's going to see a, a landing craft uh, beached on a sandbar. And he orders the soldiers around him carrying ammunition up the beach and everything. He says, drop what you're doing. Come back here. The, the, this landing craft has got to get back to its ship. And so the soldiers all kind of lean into it. And they kind of look to their left and their right. And right in the middle of them is General Patton uh, helping them push this craft back into the water. They wait for a wave to come. They, they give a push right when the wave is there. The propeller kind of bites the water and gets back off the sea. And then Patton basically turns around and reprimands everyone saying, you know, don't you know how much the Navy needs these landing craft? And so with that, he's going to head up the beach. And uh, next slide, please. And if you wonder where Patton landed exactly, he was nice enough to leave us an arrow. Uh, this is actually from his photo albums. You can see the arrow right there in the center of the beach. Um, that's where he comes ashore. And then if you look to the top of the screen, you can see the harbor there, Fadala. And then about six miles in the distance, what looks like north to us is actually south. Uh, that's Casablanca. So Patton's going to come up the beach. And next slide, please. And you can see he's soaking wet from the waist down from having pushed that landing craft back into the water. Now, I should mention that this photo is unique. It's one of only two photographs in all of World War II that show Patton hold, wearing both of his ivory handled pistols. One's a Colt revolver, the other one is a Magnum 357. Uh, the Colt he used with him in Mexico when he had to reload it in the middle of battle, he said he'd always carry two pistols so he wouldn't be kind of stuck reloading on the battlefield. Um, next slide, please. And this is the other photograph showing the two ivory handled pistols. This is also the cover of my book. Um, one of the first things he does is have his picture taken with a naval officer to prove that he is coordinating with the Navy. I fortunately couldn't find that photo. Um, and so Patton basically looks around the beach. Next slide, please. And he sees the war has kind of passed him by. The troops have already moved inland uh, to fight the Vichy French. Almost all the coastal guns have been taken at this point. And he surveys the wreckage and he sees men just kind of sitting around. Some are digging foxholes, others just sitting on the sand smoking a cigarette. And Patton just says, God, I wish I was a corporal, you know, because he wouldn't have all the responsibilities of a general. Um, next slide, please. That beach, by the way, that's what it looks like today. And you can see Fadala Harbor on the horizon. I went there a couple of years back um, and just surveyed all the locations Patton uh, was in during Operation Torch. Let's see. And so um, as he comes up the beach, a British liaison officer with the U.S. Army approaches him. Uh, this is Robert Enriquez, and he holds something up to Patton. Next slide, please. It's Charlie, the uh, uh, Hawaiian lava god of war. And Patton, you know, kind of looks past it. What happened was Patton's wife went and fished it out of the pond and gave it to Enriquez and said, make sure you give this to George on the beach for good luck. Uh, when Patton doesn't really notice it, he holds it up and says, you know, your wife wanted me to give this to you once you came ashore for good luck. And he says, so she did. And so that is the story of Charlie. Um, while Patton is standing on the beach, he's just kind of surveying everything. And he notices a local Moroccan 
walking along the beach with a mule uh, and he's picking up discarded American equipment and putting it in the saddlebags and on the back of the mule. And Patton doesn't pay much mind to this, but suddenly the Moroccan picks up an M1 Garand rifle. Patton sees this and realizes this is unacceptable. So he unholsters the 357 Magnum, takes aim and fires. Um, it does not hit the Arab. It passes near his head, but the, uh, the, the Moroccan got the message. He drops the rifle and runs off. Uh, and so to me, that's kind of Patton announcing his presence on the battlefield. You know, eyewitnesses said that, you know, heads popped up out of the sand foxholes like gophers. People were kind of scratching their heads like what just happened? And that's really Patton, you know, announcing his presence. So he heads up the beach. Uh, he's going to go to a little cabana that's been set up where there's a radio. And he's about to get on it to send messages back to the USS Augusta. Next slide, please. When all of us, next slide, there we go. So all of a sudden, a French fighter plane, this is called a Dantuin, uh, peels out of the sky and starts heading down to the beach, machine guns rattling. Uh, the American soldiers on the beach, most of them are just going to lay down and tuck into a fetal position. This infuriates Patton. He marches down to the beach. He starts ordering the men to stand up. He says, what do you think you have your rifles for? Return fire. And a few people do return fire. Well, um, as the plane kind of circles up and starts to come down for a second strafing run, Patton says the next man who lays down on the beach will be court-martialed. Uh, everyone stands this time. They return fire. The French plane does not come down as low and pulls up and, and heads off, and it kind of waggles its wings as it leaves, kind of like a greeting. Um, kind of funny side note to this. A couple of months later, Patton's wife Beatrice is visiting an Army hospital back in the United States, and she's talking to the, 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 the soldiers in the, on their cots, you know, on their beds. And she says to one, what happened to you? And he says, oh, I, I got shot by a strafing plane. And she just kind of looks at the guy and says, well, maybe you should have fired back. And all the guys in the uh, ward laugh about this. And, you know, I just thought that was that's kind of amazing that his wife and him are kind of of the same mind. Um, so once the plane departs, Patton makes his first real tactical decision of the war. Uh, he orders that all incoming ships, instead of coming onto the beach, turn into Fadala Harbor because that's safer. It'll protect him from any storms, any waves, and make you know getting troops and equipment off the landing craft a lot easier. So that's Patton's first tactical decision of the war. Um, he's going to go, uh, you know, inspecting troops until night. And as he goes into the town of Fadala. He kind of sees that all the bars are occupied and he can see through the glass who's in there and he sees all these American soldiers and they've got the, he recognizes the third infantry patch. It's a square with blue and white stripes. And, um, you know, he really doesn't get mad about this. These guys have fought their first battle and won, you know, they've taken the shore and they're taking a break. And so Patton just kind of steps back and, he, you know, he says, God, I wish I was a corporal for a second time that day. Uh, he's then going to head to the Hotel Miramar. Next slide. Now, this is a hotel that's right on the beach. I actually went to it. You can see it doesn't look that great. Um, it was condemned. It was surrounded by a fence when I went, and I was actually going to try to climb over it. And because I could see the restaurant in the back of the hotel. Um, this is the, and this is the back of the hotel, part of the hotel. Uh, but unfortunately, I was with an army captain out of the U.S. Embassy in Rabat. And he told me if I jumped the fence and got caught, it would cause an international incident. So I chose not to. Um, Patton's going to go in here and enjoy a dinner with his staff. The major D, uh, Vichy French, tells him that they don't have anything to offer the Americans to drink until one of Patton's staff officers threatens to shoot the locks off the uh, the winery. Or the, you know, the, and uh, they said suddenly all these bottles of champagne appeared and everyone invited. So. Uh, that was kind of the, the celebration at the end of the day. I think there's another shot of the Miramar because it looks kind of close here. Next slide. Um, yeah, that's kind of what it looks like or looked like back before it was condemned. Um, so with his dinner over, Patton is just going to go up to his room to sleep. And the only person that follows him is George Meeks. Next slide. And there's George. Um, he's going to have his Thompson machine gun and he's going to basically slump down outside the door with a Thompson machine gun folded in his arms. Uh, and that is really the last bit of information we have on Patton's 
first day in combat, he's still going to have 884 days to prove himself as a great commander we know him as. There was one, one big mistake, I should say, uh, made during this day under Patton. He was sending communiques to General Eisenhower at the Rock of Gibraltar, but Eisenhower wasn't getting any of them. Uh, in fact, one of Eisenhower's aides, Harry Butcher, started referring to the Western Task Force as the Lost Task Force. Eisenhower sent several planes uh, to fly over and get an assessment, but they were shot down either by Vichy French planes or by nervous American anti-aircraft gunners. Uh, he eventually resorts to using a fast uh, mine layer from the British, um, which, which gets to uh, the fleet and, um, you know, Hewitt reports everything that's gone on. This had Eisenhower really mad, by the way. And what it turned out was that Patton was using the wrong code books. The correct code books were at the bottom of a different ship. And so that's something that's going to haunt Patton for the rest of the war. Not as much the enemy in front of him, but disserving his commanders above him. And when I say commanders, I really mean Eisenhower and then later in the war, uh, Bradley. Because he knows, you know, just success is one thing, but you've got to be able to be relied upon by your commanding officers. And so that is going to haunt him for the rest of the war, always making sure that he's in good graces with Eisenhower, however frustrated he might be with him. So um, with that, uh, that, that basically concludes my talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And please submit your questions in the chat. All right, thank you so much. Um, I We have one question already, but if you have questions, please type them into the chat. We'll be happy to answer them or ask them. And if you're with our in-person audience, uh, you can ask your questions or type your, uh, give your questions to our host in person, and he will type them into the chat as well. All right, so the first question we have says, did Patton's experience in World War I help him in North Africa? I would say yes. Um, anytime you've been in combat, you've had that fear, um, it, it, it settles you for that first initial bit of combat, even though he hadn't been to war since 1918. I can tell you that Patton really resents anyone who didn't serve in World War I. He constantly uses it against Eisenhower in his diaries and his letters. Um, during the campaign in France and Germany, he got a new division under General Twaddle. And, you know, Twaddle had not gone to West Point and had not served, in, you know, in combat in World War I. And Patton is constantly critical of him. But I think the, the war jitters that uh, just about every veteran I've interviewed experience, that is calmed by, you know, experience on the battlefield. And, you know, another element Patton knows is that, you know, first reports are always wrong. And that's one of those things that you kind of have to experience to be a little steeled to. So whenever reports of negativity came in, like he was getting reports from Safi that Harmon was having trouble and that Tr Truscott was meeting overwhelming opposition, he was able to keep his cool because he knew about the fog of war that, you know, you really don't know what's over that hill and let's not worry about something we can't control. So yes, uh, Patton's experiences in World War One, I, I would say, greatly helped him on this first day and through the rest of World War II. All right. I don't see any new questions just yet. We do have some comments. Um, Mr. Stoddard said, World War II history is extremely interesting, especially Patton. So we thank you for joining us. And I agree as well, with we have a comment that says, thanks. <laughs> that says thanks for the very complete description very interesting interesting oh someone has asked to explain Vichy French sure so um uh in 1940 Adolf Hitler took over France uh defeated the French army and uh as part of the peace negotiation they negotiated that the French could hold on to a portion of their country the Germans would take over Northern France and all of the coast for their U-boats, but the French could have this sort of central and Southern part of their country. That would be called Vichy French. And part of that agreement said that if, you know, that the French would fight any enemies of Germany. 
uh, not very reliable because the French really hated the Germans for what had just happened. And it was that belief that if we attacked the Vichy French, if we landed on the shores of Vichy French territory, that they would join arms with us and turn on their German masters. And that's that's basically what happened. There was about, uh, there's one day of fighting on the Eastern Task Force, two days of fighting on the Central, and then Patton's Western Task Force. It's actually about four days um, because the French do have honor and they're not going to go down without a fight. They need to at least show that they know how to fight. Uh, and Patton, you know, almost immediately befriends some of the general officers in the Vichy French army. Um, but that's what Vichy French was. It's that portion of France and its territories that agreed to fight for Germany. Okay, thank you for that. Um, our next question is actually really appropriate. Um, we are discussing Patton because our, our year-long theme has been the making of a leader, and um, Patton was a, a leader for um, for Eisenhower. Uh, but Mr. Craig, Brian Craig has asked, who did Patton look up to as a combat leader? John J. Pershing would probably be the, the most important living person. Uh, he read heavily on Napoleon. He read a lot about the Romans and, and ancient history. But in World War II, from his diaries and letters, I would say it would be Napoleon. He was very excited to visit Napoleon's birthplace. Uh, he would, you know, quote, I guess he wouldn't quote Napoleon as much as he would talk about his battles, but he really kind of modeled himself after John J. Pershing, who, if you look at World War I photographs of him, always kept a tight, clean uniform, you know, always believed that comportment was important and bearing was important because once you face the chaos of battle, you know, you won't fall apart. You're, you're, you'll be focused on your mission. So, yeah, it really was John J. Pershing. All right. Our next question says, in Sicily, if the Allies would have captured Messina earlier and trapped more Axis soldiers on the island, could it help reduce, could it have helped reduce the disaster at Anzio? Anzio, yeah, that's correct. Sure that um, correctly. Well, okay. you're really looking at about, by the time you get to the end of the Battle of Messina, I'm sorry, yeah, around Messina, you've probably got about three or four German divisions and only one armored. Um, and Anzio is going to be, you know, six or seven months later, uh, January of 44. Um, it could conceivably have made a difference. Well, you know what? I don't know, because if you look at it specifically, General Lucas, who commanded the Anzio invasion, stopped. He didn't stop because of any great counterattacks, uh, although there were a few, uh, but he did kind of freeze in place. And that was one of the great criticisms of Lucas, that he didn't expand his beachhead greater, you know, at the time. So I think Anzio is more determinant upon Lucas's decisions and perception than it was about German forces. All right. We have a few more questions coming in. Okay. The next one says, what training did the Western task force have before going to Africa? Not a lot. Uh, the second armored division did train in the, um, the Western uh, tank training ground that Patton created. Uh, so they had some good experience. The third infantry division, um, a lot of the training for the 3rd and the 9th Infantry Divisions was amphibious training. So they were really focusing on getting troops ashore, transferring ships, uh, all this done in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Um, beyond that, I honestly can't say, but the 3rd and the 9th were regular Army Divisions. And those low-numbered Army Divisions tended to get the most training because they were already in existence, um, you know, before the war. In fact, the 2nd Armored... And I believe both the third, definitely the third, I am not sure about the ninth, participated in the Louisiana maneuvers. These were army sized maneuvers that went on in Louisiana later. There were Tennessee maneuvers. So um, I, I guess they had the best training that the Green American Army could offer at that time. But at the, the immediate training they did in the short amount of time, they only had a few months to prepare for this once they knew what they were doing. And a lot of that training was amphibious training. 
All right, thank you. Our next question says, why did the U.S. stop using tanks at the end of World War One? Budget cuts. Um, and, and I wouldn't say they stopped using tanks because if you ever look at photographs, still photos or footage of the U.S. Army pushing the bonus marchers out of Washington, D.C., you will see those small Renault tanks. The real decision was to terminate what was called the tank corps, that tanks would be their sep be a separate entity that could blitz around the battlefield. They said, you know, we're not going to create a whole bunch of new tanks. We're going to keep what we have and we're going to make them just support the infantry. And this is what Eisenhower and Patton were against. They wrote a number of journal articles, uh, you know, staking the claim of the importance of the tank core of tankers thinking independently from infantry, of, of thinking about those deep cuts into the enemy rear. But with the 1920 budget cuts, they got, a ri got rid of the tank core, dispersed the tanks into infantry units and, you know, took Eisenhower and Patton out of their favorite job. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next question, which oh, is not the last question, <laughs> says, what do you feel Eisenhower learned from Patton in terms of leadership? Great question. <laughs> Patience. Um, Patton irked Eisenhower on more than one occasion. You know, um, and it really, Eisenhower had some tough decisions to make about Patton because, you know, he kind of, he would get into trouble, slapping incidents in Sicily, um, you know, the speech in Nutsford, England, and um, he would chew Patton out, but he knew Patton was a good commander, if not great commander, and he needed him. Specifically, uh, what did he learn from Patton about leadership? He trusted Patton on the battlefield. He knew he had a fighter, and he knew the troops underneath him would fight. Uh, there's one interesting anecdote. He went to visit Patton in North Africa uh, when Patton took over Second Corps in Tunisia. And Eisenhower, one of his sergeants that was with him, McHugh, I think his name was, Patton walks up to him and says, hey, how do you feel about losing 25 bucks? And the sergeant's like, well, I wouldn't want to do that. He goes, well, put a helmet on or you will. And McHugh goes to complain to Eisenhower about this. He goes, well, you better get a helmet on. And by the way, get me one too. So I think Eisenhower respected Patton's discipline. Uh, he was willing to be a part of it. But there were parts that, that he just wouldn't tolerate. Uh, um, Bill Malden was a famous cartoonist for Stars and Stripes, and Patton detested his cartoons because they always had slovenly looking GIs in them, Willie and Joe. And um, Patton threatened to not allow Stars and Stripes to be delivered in the Third Army Zone until they got rid of Bill Malden. And uh, he actually had a meeting with Bill Malden in March of 45. And I think Patton felt like he got the best of him. You know, he kind of said, stop this nonsense. But um, Malden went ahead and drew a cartoon about the, the grief of going through Patton's army, any soldiers going through there and all the fines they had to pay. Uh, but Eisenhower kind of put his foot down and said, there will be no changes. Nobody, no general officers will tell the press how to do their jobs. Um, so he, you know, he had to course correct Patton a few times, but he really did respect Patton's leadership. Battlefield leadership. I think that I would get in trouble if I don't mention that we had Drawn to Combat here, which is the um, exhibit on uh, Malden's drawing. Oh, great. So, I wouldn't want you to get in trouble. Um, thank you to our museum after that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be in trouble. Um, our next question says, were LSTIs and LSTTs used in Operation Torch Invasion or had they yet been invented? And before you answer, I'm going to say, can you explain what for the non-military historians here, what, what's an LSTI and an LSTT? Um, LSTI, Landing Ship Tank Infantry, or Landing Ship Tracked Infantry. And the other one is LCI. P? What was the second one? L it says LSTT. LSTT. I guess that maybe that's troops. Um, well, okay, so LS, landing ships. Um, no, uh, they had landing craft, uh, LCCP, LCVPs, um, and the, known as Higgins boats uh, that would have that sort of drop ramp at the front. Yes, they did have those. Uh, but the, the landing ships, 
uh, which were a little bit bigger and had ramps on the left and the right that would drop down and the troops would march in. I've never seen a photograph or reference made to them uh, in the North African landings. It was, they were just too early in the battle. And in fact, I couldn't even tell you if they were used in Sicily, the big uh, amphibious vehicle or ship or however you want to say it in Sicily is going to be the duck, the two and a half ton truck modified to be a ship. But no, unfortunately, those uh, unique craft that became so relied upon for amphibious landings, as far as I know, were not used in the uh, in Operation Torch. In fact, I can tell you that just about every veteran I've interviewed and every firsthand account I've read, they talk about just taking those rope ladders down to the small landing craft bobbing in the water. There was no, like with it, with a landing ship like that, you can, everybody loads onto it and goes ashore. Um, you know, you don't do it the transfer right off the beach like you do with the small landing craft. All right, thank you. Our next question is, how would you describe the cooperation between Patton and Montgomery? <laughs> Um, at first respectful and then deteriorates like a sandcastle getting hit by a wave. Um, I can tell you, uh, what really started the conflict between them because Pat respected Montgomery early on. I mean, he was the guy defeating Romney and making things happen. And when, um, the, the, they, they basically have Rommel surrounded, but the weather kind of kicks in so that they, they spend some time, you know, gathering their forces and refueling and retraining. Uh, at this point, Montgomery basically puts on a, a sort of a master class of leadership for his British officers to learn what are the mistakes we made, what do we do better, what worked, and they invite American officers to, officers to this. Well, only Patton and Beadle Smith, Eisenhower's chief of staff, attend this meeting, and um, Montgomery gives one of his lectures. Montgomery was very famous for not allowing smoking in his presence, in his headquarters, or anywhere he was. And uh, so Smith and Patton are sitting there uh, listening and Patton pulls out his cigarette case and takes out a cigarette and he's tapping it on his knee and Beatle Smith kind of reaches over and is like, yeah, don't do that, George. So he doesn't. And after the speech, Patton's having lunch with a British officer named Lease. And Lee says, you know, what do you think about the fact that you weren't allowed to smoke? And he goes, well, you know, I might be old and stupid, but no, no, what does he say? I might be old. It was something like, I might be old and overweight or something like that, but I'm not stupid. You know, I wasn't going to smoke a cigarette in the presence of this guy that I like smoking cigarettes. Well, the story, you know, the game telephone where you tell one person it. Well, the story goes around the British officers. And by the time it gets to Montgomery, Lee says, what did you think of Montgomery's speech? And he says, well, I might be old. And I don't know why they said this and blind, but it didn't mean nothing. And this is a huge insult to Montgomery. Like, who's this American officer telling me after fighting this great battle that what I've done amounts to nothing? And so they really kind of get off on a bad start right there. Um, during the Sicilian campaign, Patton gets invited over to, and, and I'll, I'll say this about Montgomery. He was straight with Patton going into Sicily. He said, listen, once we land, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm not going to listen to our commander, General Alexander. And Patton goes in kind of following the rules and Montgomery starts taking roads away from him. And he's like, well, if he's going to do it, I'm going to do it. And that's what leads to the attack on Palermo. Um, so he kind of learns from Montgomery there. But later, Montgomery invites Alexander and Patton to his headquarters. And Patton said as they flew in, they saw he had this, you know, dining room set outside, you know, all set up with food and everything. And he lands and uh, Montgomery offers him a 20 cent cigar or five cent cigar. And he says that he curses himself because he rushed off the plane to shake his hand. He goes, I shouldn't have rushed off. I shouldn't have done that. Um, and they finished the briefing and Patton's like, when do we eat? And Montgomery says, okay, bye. And it infuriates Patton. He's like, I'm an army commander and this guy won't even give me lunch. So later when Montgomery comes to Patton's headquarters, Patton has the band out. He's got, you know, whole regiments out there standing at attention. You know, they put on this great lunch for him and everything. And, He's like, yeah, this is better than a five cent cigar. So that was the, got the bull rolling by the Battle of the Bulge. I was just editing volume two of my book. And um, right after the relief of Bastogne, Patton says, Montgomery's nothing but a tired little fart. So that's what he thought of him. <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Uh, next question says, why was, <laughs> why was Operation Torch spread out over three separate invasion spots? Well, um, so the first goal was to get troops ashore. Uh, the second goal was to get, it was to have them attack in co places controlled by the Vichy French, where they figured the, the fighting would be easier. The, one of Roosevelt's biggest demands about Operation Torch is that the American Army's first, or the American military's first battle could not be a defeat. You had to go in some place where you knew you could win. Um, the British felt like the Americans did not land close enough to their forces. They wanted them to land a place called Bone, B-O-N-E. But uh, I guess the practical answer is, you know, Algiers and Oran are port cities, and you're going to need those ports to provide your modern armies. And same thing with Casablanca and Safi. And so that's really why. So the, the Eastern and Central Task Forces, the idea is to capture ports. And so that's why they're so spread out. You know, and then with a patent, you know, he's basically capturing two ports, both Safi and Morocco uh, for future campaigns, like I had mentioned, uh, by the U.S. military. And that's what Roosevelt really wanted. He wanted the closest port to the United States, and that's Morocco. All right. That looks like that might be the last question. I don't see any more. Uh, so thank you for for your presentation and for answering our questions. We really appreciate it. Uh, before I go into our um, our final announcements, I do want to point out that Drawn to Combat, Bill Malton and the Art of War is still on display until November 27th in our special exhibits gallery. So it'd be a great time for you to come visit Abilene and learn all about Mr. Malton. Um, and see what uh, Mr. Hemo has been saying about him, or see the the artwork that he was talking about that Patton did not like. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take a little time to say thank you to everyone who joined us, uh, is both in per in person and virtually. We certainly appreciate it, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program. I want to take a little bit of time to say thank you to our sponsors, the Jeff Coat Foundation and the Eisenhower Foundation, of which we would not be able to have these programs if it wasn't for their gen generous support. Thank you again, Kevin. Really appreciate it and really appreciate your program. And if there are no other questions or comments or concerns, we'll say goodbye to everyone. Oh, one last thing. This is our last program for the year. We will take December off. Thank you so much for staying with us for the whole year. We will be back in January with all new programming and all new season. Everyone have a great evening or a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. <laughs>